Hello, everyone. Hope everyone's having a lovely day. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good and you? I always do this. Okay, wait. I might have to just. Is that better? Yes, yes. Now I can see you. Also, Let's by see. the way, I don't know if you can see, I have my little oh. supporter there. Hello, Ruti. Look there. Mine's hibernating. Oh, she's gone. Was it for moral support? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shame. Okay, so we got our fur babies with us. We're good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely. Awesome. How are you, Mona? I'm good, thanks. Um, enjoying a nice warm day in Bucharest. Um, so that's nice. You know, the summer is here. Um, so yeah, I'm good. How are you? Uh, quite the opposite here. It's very cold. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't know if. Uh, I mean, it is, we are going into winter, but we've had a cold front this past week. So there's like been a lot of mm. frost and everything, and obviously we can only go out from six to nine in the morning. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah. but it's been Isn't nice. Isn't it uh, changing with you guys now? Aren't you dropping down um, a level so that you have yes. a little bit more okay. So tomorrow we're dropping down, I think, to level three. Uh, so no, were we on level three? Well, anyways, we're dropping down one level. Yeah. So likely we can actually. <laughs> go out anytime during the day which is nice because then we don't have to go out mm. early in the morning and then freeze and then because the problem is especially in Pretoria it's so cold in the morning but then by 12 o'clock you're taking off layers and you hot and then you could tan yeah. if you want to um, and then it drops again so yeah that fluctuation has been a little bit interesting <laughs> yeah. I think that's like you know the typical kind of South African weather um, mm. I think that's why I've it's it's been so nice for me to actually like um, experience summer now over here and not have winter because I also know you know like those seasons and stuff like that it can be so crazy and <laughs> if you can only go outside and it's cold in the morning and yeah. you know when you have to stay inside like I said to James today like if you're actually indoors and it's hot it feels like a sin yeah it really feels like you should not be indoors <laughs> you know? exactly like if you're indoors and it's cold outside you kind of like Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have to go out. I can hibernate, and it's acceptable. <laughs> but anyways, Mona, it's so nice to chat to you again. Um, just to give everyone an update of what we're doing, we sent out some um offers for questions that anyone wanted to ask us for sports psychology or mindset purposes, and now we're going to answer some of those questions. So we are going to answer it from our athletic experiences. So with me from CrossFit and um, with Mona mainly from Olympic weightlifting and then also from a more psychological academic side. Um, hello to me <laughs> um, to kind of give you guys more of, you know, that kind of insight. So yeah, just to let you know, um, let you guys know what's going on. So whenever you're ready, Mona, we can start. Okay, cool. Um so, G, I I think you have the first question yes. <laughs> that you wanted to ask. So, the first question that we got was how to deal with the comparison trap, either between record holders, like specifically for um, weightlifting, or just, you know, between general athletes. Um, so, talking from a perspective now of being an athlete, um, I think it's definitely something that a person can fall into the trap of, you know, comparing yourself to other athletes. Um, weightlifting is a, it's a very individualized sport. Um, but obviously you are chasing that number one spot, especially if you're a competitive weightlifter. Um, so definitely, um, if you have someone that's very close to you, um, with totals or, you know, you're trying to qualify for events, you know, like I have the Olympic qualifications and, you know, it's obviously Olympics coming up and stuff. So you definitely do compare yourself to other athletes. Um, but this is, in my opinion, um, it's not always the wisest thing to do because I feel that, you know, if you compare yourself to other athletes, you start to play their game. Um, so I've always been an athlete where like, I will go to the back when it's the warm up for my competition. And like I say to myself, you know, I've done the hard work, everything that I could have done. Um, 
you know, it's just me and the barbell now. And whenever I've done that and I've gone on the competition stage, I've, I felt so confident not worrying about anyone out there. Um, and in the total I made that I've trained for, um, I mean, that, that's, that's on me. So when I hit that, you know, instead of comparing myself to someone else, I have felt that that's also the time I've done my best in competition. Mm -hmm. um, if I've gone to chase someone, that's always when you tend to fall short because um, your mm -hmm. focus is then on that person. Um, so this mm -hmm. is now from speaking from an Olympic weightlifting point of view. Mm -hmm. um, so, Giselle, maybe you can speak about, you know, maybe from a, like, CrossFit point of view, mm -hmm. like, how is it for you? Do you compare yourself to, like, your fellow athletes, or do you just mm -hmm. play your game um, when you compete? Um, yeah, maybe yeah. we can talk about it. Well, I think it's so interesting what you said about, um, you know, when you focus on yourself, that's when you do best. And when you focus on other people, that's kind of where you fall, fall short. And I think it plays really nicely into that whole idea of when you're focusing on yourself, you can, you, that's things that you can control. You can't control what anyone else is doing. So I think that's really awesome. And definitely the one thing I always try to think of when it comes to that is firstly acknowledging the fact that the, at some point there will be a time where people will compare that that's yes. you know, but you need to get over that you can't fall back on that and just you know fall victim to that so the one thing that definitely helps me is to understand that i have a certain amount of energy for the day i have finite energy and i give that energy to things that benefit me my happiness my goals my training everything you know so training eating socializing friends whatever that's an investment. It's a trade-off. Because if I give my energy to that, I'm going to be getting something positive back. But if I give my energy to someone else or comparing myself to someone else, I'm not getting, getting anything positive back. And I can't get that energy back. So it's wasted energy. You know, I've, I've reached the end of the day and something that I, you know, energy that I could have put into something that would have given me value I haven't. So that's kind of the thing that I try and focus on is just understanding that whole value added trade off concept. And it, it helps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, that's such an, it's such an awesome question because there's, I mean, you, everyone falls in that trap every now and again, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a matter of like how you as a person deal with it. Um, I know you do get also some athletes and like bouncing off what you just said, um, you get some athletes who actually do get motivated and they do get psyched up by comparing themselves to other athletes. Mm -hmm. And then you do get other athletes where if, as soon as they compare, like with myself, if I compare myself to another athlete, that's when I fall short. Mm -hmm. So very like individualized, like kind of understand what works for you and go with that instead of trying to, you know, yeah, do something else. I like that. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Cool, awesome. I hope okay. that answered your question, guys. No, and if anyone has any other questions, you know, they can just send out a question out there and, you know, if we don't get to it today, um, we'll definitely, you know, we'll jot down all the questions and get to it in future talks and yeah. stuff like that. Perfect. Um, so you guys can just put that in the box there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, so to get to another question we got, um, so is motivation a genetic trait? Um, do some people need more of a push than others? Mm -hmm. what do you think? So I think, I mean, it, it's such a an in-depth question um, that if I had to try and summarize it, I would say everyone is born with certain traits, right? It can kind of come down to that whole nature versus nurture thing. And if you'd like to look at it in a picture, you can imagine like a soundboard, you know, like, you know, you, you're turning up the volume on, on certain parts of the soundboard. And say you have happiness, um, pessimism, and motivation or whatever, okay? Every person has those traits, but they'll, their tendencies will just be different, right? So this person, their tendency to be happier will just be a little bit higher and, you know, to be um, a pessimist might be a little bit lower, you know, vice versa, whatever. So it, in terms of tendencies, that could play a factor, but it's not an excuse to, to kind of fall victim to that again. And the reason I say that is because humans are so incredible. So we have this thing called neuroplasticity, which means that you can change the structure of your brain just by thinking certain things or practicing certain things, right? So again, if you want to look at it in another picture, you have 
a field of snow and there are people on um, sleds and they're going in the same direction all the time and their paths are, are embedding deeper and deeper into the snow because they're going in the same direction. Now this person comes along and they're like, actually, I'm kind of getting bored of this. I want to go in a different direction. So they change the direction of their sled and it ingrains over the other one. So the old one ends up disappearing and that's how your brain works. So if you tell yourself, for instance, I'm not motivated, you know, I'm not good at this, you know, I suck, whatever, that's going to be embedded in your brain. But if you flip that around and you just practice positive affirmations and you say to yourself, like, I'm motivated, I got this, I enjoy this, I'm good at this, this makes me happy, all of those neural pathways will then start to build and the old ones will die away. And I think it's honestly just a practice thing. Like, I'm sure, Mona, you know, with you, you've probably experienced it where some days you're like, should I really don't feel like training today. But because you've practiced that discipline consistently throughout your life, you kind of like, oh, whatever, like this is how I feel. Let me just go in and, and, you know, do what needs to be done because I have my goal that I'm working towards, even if at that moment you're not feeling 100% motivated. So I definitely don't really think genetics play a massive role in it. I think it's mainly just consistent practice. What yeah. do you think? <laughs> um, I actually agree with you 100%. I mean, I've always been like a big believer, like, um, like it's a mental skill. And just like your physical side of things, the mental side has to be trained consciously. Mm -hmm. um, I think it does also play a big role with um, the people who are around you. Like say, obviously, if you're a youngster and you grow up around people who are also very motivated, um, they... Mm -hmm. They push you to be your best. Um, you know, they, you've just got these great role models like um, that's always around you and uh, mentors and stuff like that. I mean, and that's probably something that helped me become a very motivated athlete mm -hmm. is, um, you know, I've had my, my dad um, push me in my training. Um, you know, we've always had this like mindset, like, you know, you never quit. It doesn't matter how tough things get. It doesn't matter like if you've had a bad competition, um, you know, you dust it off, you get straight back on the horse and, you know, you work towards your next goal. Um, so I very much believe it's something that has to be nurtured over time. Um, but I do believe, you know, like the people around you definitely plays like a big role when it comes to actually mm -hmm. helping to motivate you. Um, but with sport itself, I mean, you get some people who like, they have extrinsic motivators and people who are like, like I'm a person that's very intrinsic. Um, mm -hmm. So I've never done it for the extras. I've never done it um, just for the medals or money or, you know, whatever, um, for mm -hmm. status. I've, I've done it because of like how amazing I feel when like I've, you know, hit a new personal best or I've broken a new record. I mean, like at Commonwealth Games, when I uh, got the bronze medal, I just started crying on stage because it's such an internal thing for me. It's like, wow, you know, like all that hard work has paid off. So I'm very much, like I said, I'm a believer that it's something that, yeah, it has to be uh, nurtured mm -hmm. over time. hundred percent. I agree. And that's awesome. Like, and what I love about, you know, saying that it, it is something that you can practice is that it puts that, that ball in your court. It, it puts you in control. And that's why it, when people start talking about, genetics and traits and stuff like that I get very tentative with it because I do feel that if you just practice certain things you believe in yourself you know you practice your mental and your physical skills you can do whatever you want to do and that mm -hmm. sense of control I, I really I, I, I love that oh. yeah <laughs> awesome awesome okay so third question Mona how do you get buy-in from young athletes on the importance of mental skills just as much as the physical skills? Um, I think, okay, so Giselle, I think this is a really important question. Um, I've actually um, made a YouTube video about uh, uh, mental skills and youth athletes recently on my YouTube ch channel called Mental Skills by Mona. And I, I mean, I love working with youth athletes and I believe that youth athletes are, you know, the base or the foundation of any great athlete out there. It's like, um, if you can, like I've got the saying, and there's something again that I got from my dad is like, you know, bend the branches while they are young. Um, because, mm. you know, um, if you can start to um, 
teach the youngsters out there mental skills from a youth age, imagine how how much of a difference it will make when they are older athletes. Then by the time that, you know, if they've practiced everything as a youth athlete, by the time they are older athletes, um, like junior or like senior type athletes, then it becomes like an automatic thing. Um, it's not anymore something that, you know, they have to sit and be like, okay, I have to do goal setting. Um, okay, I have to write down um, what what self-talk I'll be telling myself, you know? Um, so what I've done, and to get back to the actual question, what I've done with my youth athletes um, is I have made mental skills training uh, like a fun topic for them. Um, like I have not literally, I've not sat down with athletes and be like, okay, we are now going to do mental skills training. Um, I have tried to incorporate it into their actual training. Um, so I would take all my little weightlifters that I had, and this was anything from the ages of like six, seven years up to like 15, 16 years that I saw my youth range. Um, and I would say to them, you know, um, just to teach you guys, you know, a little bit about mental skills and how important it is, you know, to help you reach your goal. Um, and we'll sit down and we'll talk about goal setting and I'll ask my athletes, you know, do you know what is goal setting? And, you know, they will have their little feedback to say. And I used to do this often at the end of the session. So like um, when it's stretching time and it's relaxing time and, you know, now the mind is kind of off training and it's like a little bit more relaxed. Um, and I'll say to them, you know, guys, um, what we will do is for the next session, I want you to think what will be your goal for the next week of training. Mm -hmm. Even if it's like to improve your technique, if it's to improve by one kilogram, you know, in your, in your total mm -hmm. or your lift, or to do more repetitions. Um, I want you to also share like um, what goals do you have? Mm -hmm. Because I also feel that like as a coach, like you can give them this kind of a, like a responsibility um, and it teaches them also to make decisions by themselves. Um, mm -hmm. It's not just a coach forcing goals on an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. I think especially as youngsters, because, you know, you get different kind of personalities and, you know, like we were talking earlier about the different traits. Um, you get some athletes that if you force a goal on an athlete, it makes them so nervous and they feel like they have to, I mean, like, it's almost like... Um, they have to uh, show show that, you know, they can do this. And it puts such a big pressure on them. Mm -hmm. um, that's the word I was actually looking for. And by putting this pressure on a youngster, like, you know, at that young age, you can make or break an athlete. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we'll talk about things like goal setting and make it fun for them. And we'll talk about, you know, self-talk. And we'll talk about, you know, whenever you start to think negatively, like throw that thought away, um, you know, replace it with something positive, be like, and, and something fun for them, like to say I'm strong or, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm powerful um, or something like that to actually just make them like they laugh about it and stuff. And But mm -hmm. they, if you can do it in a way where it, it teaches them, but in a fun manner, I feel like it sticks a lot more with them. Mm -hmm. Then if you go and you're like a teacher and you're like, okay, this is the syllabus. This is what you're going to do. You know, they get that mm -hmm. already from school. So I yeah. think as a coach, um, if you can kind of bring the fun aspect into things, it it helps them and it, it helps them also to get educated with the mental skill side of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Giselle, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe you've got more experience also with working with kids or something like that if yeah. you would like to add. No, I, I, I really love what you said about, you know, making it fun because I think sometimes it can be really easy for people to fall into the trap of making things serious and kind of... Um, making it very systematic because that's how athletes kind of, we thrive off structure and, you know, precision and stuff like that. But I think to remember that you're dealing with children is, is a very important skill and, um, you know, to be able to relate to them on, on their level. And like you said, make it fun for them, um, you know, practice those mantras that you're talking about and simple things. It doesn't need to be this whole long paragraph that you need to recite yourself every single morning just little things like i'm strong i'm powerful i believe in myself it's actually it's so weird because chav and i were watching master chef uh, master chef junior the other night we're like obsessed and um <laughs> <laughs> we try and replicate things but it doesn't work out well makes us feel really bad about ourselves it's amazing no it's it's uh, on another level 
But the little girl, before she, you know, started, she literally like said to herself, she was like, I believe in myself. And we looked at each other and we were like, oh, wow. that is amazing parenting because you don't just say something like that without having practiced it before. And it's, it's so short, it's so simple, but it's so powerful. So I think definitely to, to reinforce those little things that are easy to do, easy to remember and sustainable. Um, and I think also to just teach them the importance of mental, you know, having mental strength and, you know, because at the end of the day, when you're competing, it's generally the mental that, you know, will, will give you a win or a loss. It's not really the physical, it's the mental. And if you can teach children the importance of that from when they're quite young, I think, like you said, that'll have the ability to change them as an athlete and really propel them. So yeah, no, I think I think that's it's it's so awesome to know that you can have that much of an effect um, on little people, little kids. Yeah, <laughs> um, I just want to add one thing. Um, I see one of my youth athletes that I used to have in back in America. You just said hi, so that's pretty awesome to see. Like you know, <laughs> my athletes. I mean, I used to coach him from such a like a young age, and yeah. I've been seeing. Him his stuff lately on Facebook and on Instagram because he's into baseball now and he's mm -hmm. super tall. I mean, it's insane <laughs> in the last like two years how much you know the yeah. crazy. That's yeah. so cool. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so, um, so, now this question, um, I think we can both answer this question also from a, a weightlifting and a CrossFit uh, perspective, but mm -hmm. um, this is a, like quite an interesting question I got. Um, and the nice thing about this is like some people would think um, when it comes to your breathing in training or in competition or when you're doing lifting, you know, they just like, oh, it's just, you know, it's just breathing. But they don't actually realize like how much your breath can actually um, change the way you do things, like the amount of explosive power you put in and, you know, just the way you also feel confident in with your lifting. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how do you use your breath just before a big lift it could either be in crossfit or it could be in weightlifting and i think where you know we, you can also answer this question is like if you have to do like a lot of repetitions like mm -hmm. you know you have to do like 10 cleans or 10 snatches mm -hmm. or something like that mm -hmm. how does your how do you breathe and like you know how do you regulate it yeah so awesome question because i think if you can really practice your breathing techniques and even if you just do you know um, breathing drills in, in and about your training um, to strengthen your lung capacity and everything. I think that's great. Um, breathing is, is, is so interesting because I think it's specifically, um, you, you know, you do it for specific things, right? So, for instance, if you, like, almost hyperventilate before um, an event, you know, it could tense you out and it could mean that then your muscles tighten and then you actually get short of breath and, you know, it, it, it could be the completely wrong thing to do before an event. Um, so actually like slowing down your breathing, you know, kind of finding a rhythm in through the nose, out through the mouth to kind of focus you for that event, um, I think could could change the whole event completely. So I think definitely before something, I wouldn't... I wouldn't psych myself up because um, especially if you're going into something that has a lot of skill in it, you kind of want to be calm. Um, but then obviously for lifting, I know that breathing is a, is a massive thing for activation. And like you said, to, to generate that, that power and everything. So I think to just know when you need to use it, what you need to do um, to, to get the, the maximum output for it for things like, you know, um, repetitions of certain things i think just finding a steady flow of breathing it doesn't again it doesn't need to be you know like a cookie cutter approach like what could work for one person might not work for you um for yeah. me what i try and do is i just try and keep that flow of breathing so just in through the nose out through the mouth um on the same rep you know like if you're going for running you always breathe out on the one foot and I, you know you try and apply that to to you know the the multiple reps that we do in, in training but i think definitely knowing when to slow it down knowing when to speed it up can can be a game changer and i'm sure for weightlifting that that's yeah it's definitely something that's useful 
Yeah, I mean, also for, for weightlifting, I mean, the point you made is like really it's 100% true. And the thing with breathing, especially when it comes to before you actually do your lifting, um, like you get so many different kinds of athletes. Um, like I've had athletes and even myself, you know, getting to learn like what works and what doesn't work and athletes that I've coached before. Um, I get athletes again that I have to psych up. I have to get their, mm. their heart rate up a bit more before they actually get energy and they're ready to lift and they're ready to go on the platform. Otherwise, they are asleep and they're slow and they're sluggish. Um, and that could come from nerves again. And then mm. you get some athletes who, again, they are too jittery. Um, mm. You know, they're too psyched up. And, you know, obviously with like the arousal curve, like obviously if you get that arousal level way too high, then at the end of the day, it, it affects performance. So if you... Under aroused, it affects performance in a negative mm-hmm. way. Over aroused, it affects performance. So the thing is, you have to eat that sweet spot. And again, mm-hmm. it's something that it happens over years. And also, athletes change. I mean, in the last twenty years of me doing weightlifting, um, I've changed as an athlete. I've changed with what works, what doesn't work. Um, you know, before Commonwealth Games, I realized actually that. I get very nervous before my events. You know, I've been competing then for like, you know, what was it, 17, 18 years. And like people would think, oh, do you still get nervous for events? But you still do because it's big events. It's international. You have, you know, the whole world watching you. It's live on TV. um, And it's like you also have these expectations. You have these expectations for your sponsors, expectations on yourself. Um, you know, and again, to like kind of make it where it's just you and it's all the training that you've done that counts. Um, and over the years, I've, you know, developed uh, uh, breathing techniques and I've gotten breathing techniques to help me like calm down, uh, make mm-hmm. me feel more focused. Um, I think also breathing techniques is so awesome to help you get in the zone. Um, because like what you were saying earlier, you know, um, you know, breathing in a more like a steady state um, instead of like like getting your heart rate up and stuff like mm-hmm. that. I mean, like I said, you do get some athletes where it works for, but for myself, um, <clears throat> when I get like that, I, I feel jittery and I feel like all over the show and mm-hmm. I don't feel solid under the bar, um, you know, so I'm, I'm that athlete that I have to get my breathing under control and, you know, that helps me focus like, you know, 100%. Mm-hmm. I walk on the platform and I feel like I have energy. It's it's the most amazing thing when you get your breathing right, how much energy you actually have as well. Mm-hmm. And then with waking yourself, you know, when it comes to your activation of it, um, I see a lot of athletes, you know, I always tell athletes, you know, you mustn't breathe like a fish. <laughs> you know, you mustn't just go, like, it's almost <laughs> like they're just uh, biting the you know? bubbles. <laughs> yeah, just for bubbles. <laughs> and you know, like teaching them to, when they breathe, to have like a, big chest and to keep you know all the air in their lungs and it must mm-hmm. be a, a big and fast breath because you also can't go <sighs> I mean if you breathe slow like that also you're not going to get that activation especially just before you do your jerk um so yeah that's that's mm-hmm. all things that actually like it plays a massive role in how you're going to perform your lifting your mm-hmm. explosive like you said your activation um so it like breathing is of utmost importance i mean mm-hmm. like i said it's also something that you have to train um mm-hmm. some athletes obviously like um can breathe more naturally like it's just a natural thing for them mm-hmm. and some athletes you know you have to train them to to breathe correctly and i think yeah. it's an important skill like um a coach must also be able to teach athletes 100 percent, and it's 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 so interesting how Breathing is such a natural thing, obviously, but there are a lot of people, and I was definitely one of them, who actually don't know how to breathe properly because a lot of the time we breathe from our chest and that tightens things up. It can make you feel anxious. It, you know, restricts your your breath and everything. But, you know, when you start to learn, like, okay, you actually have to breathe from the stomach and everything, it, it makes the world a difference. And I think what I really liked there, what you said as well, is to find out what works for you. You know, if you are already, you know, quite a, not a highly strong person, but you're already naturally activated, don't activate yourself even more because you're just going to get yourself into a frenzy and not know what to do. And, uh, but then if yeah. you're someone who is kind of chill and relaxed and, you, you know, you need that little bit of extra activation, like, do it yourself. Like you can do it. So I think that's great. Like, again, it's 
it, it's so individualized. It's so specific to you as a person. And I think that's that whole part of the journey is figuring that out, figuring out what works for you and everything. So, yeah, no, I love that. Love it. Okay. Awesome. Next question. Mona, what is the demand like for sports psychologists privately? I'm interested in either a master's in C and C, sports psychology or sports performance. I know I want to run my own private coaching practice, so I wonder if a freelance sports psychologist is a worthwhile investment. Um, so that is a, it's an interesting question, and I definitely believe what also makes a difference is what country you are in, um, what sports you are working with, um, because if you, for instance, are in South Africa, could maybe not be such a massive demand. Um, but maybe if you're in the USA or in Australia, mm -hmm. um, you know, being a sports psychologist is like a huge demand, you know. Um, I definitely did find. Um, so when I actually uh, finished my honors degree, I was working with like a, a lot of high performance center athletes. I was working with rugby players. I was working with boxers, tennis players. So I was working with a wide range of like individual athletes. Um, and then obviously with the rugby as a team. Um, but I found actually there was more demand for my sports, my sports psychology skills as like a practitioner when I was in USA. Um, so when I was in USA, mm -hmm. I would often do um, sports psychology group talks, and then I would have some individual uh, people that I would work with also. Um, but like I said, it, it, it literally depends where you're from. I mean, even since I've been in Romania, um, I was approached by um, the Irish national team. So I was working with a high performance squad. So I would fly over to Ireland, um, give... Um, sports psychology talks, um, work with some athletes, um, you know, and that was actually, I was working with the youth group and with the, with the senior group. Um, so obviously in Ireland, there's, there's a demand, you know, mm -hmm. um, in Romania, again, not so much of a demand also because of kind of the language barrier. So, mm -hmm. um, I found, you know, being English, trying to speak to athletes who potentially some can speak English, uh, some can only speak Romanian. Um, so that has been like, you know, kind of difficult. So I've uh, like put my expertise more in like other countries and athletes um, all over the world. But um, mm -hmm. you know, it's definitely something that it's individualized to your country and the sport that you are in because um, you could also have a potential a connection in say a high performance center and you know, as soon as you finish your studies, you have a job immediately. Mm -hmm. um, or you could, you know, you, you did your whole honors and masters and, you know, you go and do your PhD, but there's not really a demand for a sports psychologist in your country. Mm -hmm. So I definitely believe, Giselle, it's something where um, it, it literally depends where you are, you know, mm -hmm. the place that you've built, maybe your athletic background, um, the connections that you've made over the mm -hmm. years. So that's kind of like my answer that I would give to that person who asked that question. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then basically make the decision from there. At the end of the day, it's also, if, if it's a passion of yours, I believe that you will make it work. Um, mm -hmm. You will go out there and, you know, it's, as sad as it is, like sometimes, you know, you have to work a bit for free to like show people your skills. And once they are like, whoa, we need this person as a sports psychologist, mm -hmm. you know, um, we're definitely going to hire them. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's kind yeah. of my answer to that. So I don't know what you, how you've experienced it. So I, I haven't, I don't have, um, I like as much experience as you hands on, but I do definitely think that, you know, talking about the demand in different countries, I can definitely understand that because in South Africa, it's not as in demand as like you said, in um, the U S or Australia. But what I think is so amazing with the world and the direction that it's going in is that remote work is becoming big and it has been for, for a while. And I think now with, you know, everything that's happened with lockdown and COVID-19, it's going to become bigger. So there are platforms for people who have studied that in South Africa to be able to practice remotely and practice with people all around the world. So I definitely think, you know, if this was a situation 50 years ago where we didn't have that access, it would be a bit different. But now yeah. I think, you know, like the world is your oyster. Like we are all connected. So definitely no boundaries there, I, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I must say that, like you said, now the online platform is definitely growing. And, you know, to have 
counseling sessions with an athlete over Skype or over FaceTime or WhatsApp or whatever is so easy. And it's basically the same as face to face. Um, it, I mean, even, you know, when people coach nowadays, you know, um, because obviously with the restrictions and stuff like that, a lot of times now the athlete will train at their house and the coach, you know, will be at their house and they can't mm -hmm. actually be there, but the coach will coach them online. Um, and you know, be there as like an eye on the person directly being able mm -hmm. to give them instruction and stuff like that. So I would say definitely the fact that online stuff has been increasing and it's been opening up for, you know, this kind of job perspective is an amazing thing. 100%. <laughs> okay. Um, so next question um, that I got, and I'll ask you this, G. Um, how would you structure a daily mental skills practice plan? And how would you change the amount of focus, attention towards the different parts of the plan, depending on where the athletes are at in their session? Mm -hmm. Oh, love this question. <laughs> So, um, as we've established, like mental training is so important and it could be what, you know, decides the first place from the second place. So I think first understanding and appreciating that is a massive step in the right direction. Um, I've actually been experimenting a bit with uh, mental training a bit during this lockdown. And what I've found works best for me is doing something that's sustainable, right? And what I mean by that is, doing daily practices that are enjoyable enough for you to want to do them every day or at yeah. least, you know, Monday to Friday. If you cram so much into one session and then it starts to feel like a chore, because especially with, with mental practices like this, you don't really have people checking in on you. You don't have any benchmarks where you can tick off and be like, okay, I achieved that. You know, there's no really measurement of performance. So you, you have to hold yourself accountable. So I would say definitely make sure that it's it's sustainable for you to enjoy it so that you can do it consistently because with everything, consistency is key. There's no point in doing mental training for a week and then taking another week off and then, you know, doing it here and there. Like if you can do it as consistently as possible, brilliant. So the structure that I follow is um, every morning from Monday to Friday, sometimes on the weekend, I will write down, I'll do a little bit of journaling. So the first three things, I'll, I'll write down three things that I'm grateful for because I feel like if you are living your day from a place of gratitude, then you, you already have everything that you need. Everything else is kind of an added bonus. So it puts yeah. you on that, that, that positive setting. So three things I'm grateful for. The second thing, I write down my intention for the day, you know, um, whether it be, flow like today I just want to get into the flow of things or whether it be intensity you know today I want to attack things with intensity or happy you know whatever that's my intention for the day everything I do in that day work friends training that's the word I'm going to try and encompass after that I write down my three affirmations and that's generally specific to what I'm feeling at the time. So I try and keep those affirmations as consistent as possible so that, again, that constant repetition, it gets embedded into my brain, um, and then I can move on from there. Then three days a week, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I do um, visualization meditations, and I will make sure that I visualize something specific to what I want to achieve in training, right? So... Let's just say, for instance, I want to snatch a certain, you know, weight, like that's my goal. I will visualize that in my meditation, but then I'll also visualize my greater goal as well so that that, again, has that consistency. Once I've achieved that goal, then I'll change that little bit of, um, you know, visualization. So let's say now I want to clean X weight. That'll then be my visualization, yeah. but still that goal, that, that um, bigger picture stays. Again, consistency. So I do that three times a week and then also have like a vision board that, um, you know, I go through and uh, also I try and do that minimum three times a week. So again, like I would try and keep it as simple as possible, try and keep it enjoyable. I mean, you, you're visualizing things, you're creating your life that, that you want and, you know, that you're striving for. It should be fun, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely, I don't know if I went on a tangent there, but 
to summarize my point, <laughs> I would say um, I have a perfect explanation. <laughs> it's awesome. I would say journal in the morning. Write down what you're grateful for. Write down your intention. Write down your affirmations. Say your affirmations, um, and then you know in the afternoon do. I mean, it doesn't need to be long. It can be a 10 minute yeah. visualization or meditation. And I think another thing to also remember is that you don't actually need to always set aside time to practice affirmations or visualizations or, or positive thinking, you know, throughout the day, as soon as you notice a negative thought in your head, just switch it with a positive thought. Yeah. As soon as you in the car and you're zoning out, use that time to, to practice visualization. It doesn't always necessarily need to be a specific, you know, time set yeah. thing. Yeah. But what about you? <laughs> um, well, Basically, to bounce off what you were saying now, I mean, like, you had, like, a perfect routine there. And I actually saw someone made a comment. They were like, whoa, you know, Giselle, you have, like, so much time. But like you said earlier, like, people don't actually realize you don't need hours in a day because people think, like, okay, there's goal setting. Then they think, oh, my gosh, I have to spend time on goal setting. I have to spend time on uh, practicing a routine. I have to spend time on self-talk. I have to spend time on mm -hmm. being confident. And all those things are, like, it, some of it comes naturally and obviously like like you were saying if you realize um you are having a negative thought then to replace that negative thought with something positive um also you know something that we do with a lot of athletes is we do like evaluations and stuff like that where you actually see which mental skills they are lacking and like or which ones they can actually do better at like you can get some athletes who are super confident um but they don't set goals and you're like mm -hmm. um so, so what do you want to achieve? And they just like, you know, I don't know, whatever my coach wants me to achieve, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so then you can kind of help them, you know, have a little bit more like structure in their life by actually working towards something. Um, so I can, I definitely think that, you know, you can help someone with all those different types of skills and then prioritize whichever skill they need to work on a lot more mm -hmm. because like, um, especially if you have no education on the mental skills, like you don't just want to go bam, practice all the mental skills and think, you know, it's going to make a massive difference. Um, and something that I've done like over the years, and I think it comes also so naturally. And it's something that my, my coach used to help me with my sports psychologist when I was younger um, is, is how to set goals, how to set short-term mm -hmm. goals, how to set long-term goals, uh, how to set an action plan, how am I going to achieve that goal, you know? Um, and that's also very good with, like, when you do practice these kind of skills, to also share them with your coach. Um, there's a lot of times where athletes have a goal and the coach has a different goal for the athlete. So to get them basically on the same path, to have the same vision of what they want to achieve together, um, I think especially, you know, for weightlifting and the same even for CrossFit, it's, you know, if you are training for, um, I know they don't, I can't remember if they have regionals anymore or not, but say for instance, <laughs> okay, so say for instance, you are preparing for sanctionals, but your coach is like, no, 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 like, you know, our attention needs to be in fitness and Cape Town. So he wants you to peak at fitness and Cape Town, but you want to peak at sanctionals, for example. So there has to be like uh, understanding between the coach mm -hmm. and athlete, you know, working towards this type of goal. Um, and then things that I've also been practicing a lot more is um, during the lockdown. And I think this is what the lockdown has also kind of helped the person with because you have some extra time. So you have time to actually work on yourself and, you know, becoming more confident and maybe practicing visualization. Um, and I've been doing a lot of like meditation type stuff and yoga, which I didn't really have a lot of time for before because I would be working on my, say my online coaching or um, I train twice a day, so I'm at Dynamo, my sports center, you know, from the morning, I get back late at night, so you think, you know, okay, I have to get my nutrition in, and like maybe before bed, you know, you'll think a bit, you know, on what's your plan for the next day, but it's, it's difficult to fit in a lot of things when um, you don't really have all the time, and sometimes even don't have the energy, so mm -hmm. if you don't have the energy or the time to do um, things like yoga or meditation or visualization, like you were saying earlier, you don't need hours for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's literally something that like you can wake up 
10 minutes, even yeah, 10, 15 minutes earlier in the morning, um, do some meditation, do a bit of journaling. I mean, people mm -hmm. sometimes think that it's something that takes hours to do. It's not. Mm -hmm. You can make it short, um, make it powerful, mm -hmm. and it will make such a big difference already. I mean, yeah. it's already getting your day started on a positive note. 100%. And, you know, I think, again, it comes down to such an individualized basis, like find what works for you, you know, what works for another person might not work for you and what works for you might not work for someone else. So really have fun in that creative process. And the one thing I would just suggest is either do it in the morning or at night. So the, the, the one kind of routine I like to follow is that in the morning, I journal to sit my mood for the day and in yeah. the evening i reflect to yes. kind of think what did i learn and what can i change because if you again if you do that every single day you're constantly growing even if it's yes. just you know small little steps and after 365 days that'll be massive so it doesn't need to be complicated doesn't need to be long it just needs to be consistent i think exactly i 100 percent agree <laughs> Sorry, Ajax was growling a bit there. I don't know. He's being well, a bit of a baby. He <laughs> was next to me stealing my paper with my questions. Oh, is that why you were moving? And then she stole my lip eyes. So that's why I have my lip eyes in my hand. So she was <laughs> trying to get my attention. So they're funny. trying to sabotage our chat. <laughs> exactly. Well, they're like, no, I want to have the show, you know? I want yeah. to have the line. Next thing we're going to look, and it's just going to be Greasy and Ajax having a conversation. Exactly. That would be quite interesting. <laughs> about mental skills. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, next question. Mona, how do you find a way to deal with psychology in a team setting? Do you try and find common drives in individual ones, or do you try to unify the team by finding only the common ones? Let us remember that we have limited time with our athletes face-to-face, -face, et cetera. So should we also consider meeting with our athletes face-to-face -face, uh, outside of practice? Um, so firstly, I, if, if a person, you know, don't have a lot of time um, and you do have time to speak to your athletes or whatever, I believe as a coach, um, obviously there will always be a common goal and a common thing that you guys are working for. So the whole team, has to be on board with what they want to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. I believe it's very important for the coach and athlete to like sit down, even if it's the coach and the whole group of athletes, and talk about, you know, what what is up next? Um, what mm -hmm. is the competition we are working for? I'm a very big believer and also, you know, when you start to train mental skills or teach mental skills to your athletes, um, especially if it's a team setting, to do it in the off season. So that, you know, you don't just bombard athletes with new skills just before competition. Because, it, you know, like a physical skill, if you change something literally the day before game day or the week of game day, it could have a, detri a detrimental effect. Um, so you want to make sure that you get athletes used to the type of skills that you are teaching them. Um, something that I've liked, um, especially when I used to work with my rugby players, is I used to have like a presentation uh, once a week with the athletes and we would discuss uh, one of the, the mental skills. So if we talk about goal setting or if we talk about visualization um, or if we talk about self-talk, to get them like um, aware of what are the mental skills. And then I also used to like to sit with them individually um, because I believe, you know, when you do a team sport, every single person has their own strengths. And mm -hmm. with every single person's own strength, um, I just want to show you something here. I don't know if you can see my body. Oh, my word. I'm trying to take oh. my lip eyes again, trying to sabotage my, my answer. You're so cheeky. <laughs> um, yeah, so, oh, she is. She's obviously I hungry. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, I would then sit with my athletes also individually um, to get to know them, um, to talk to them um, about, you know, what are their, what are their individual goals for the team and you know to find out kind of you know sometimes what can happen even with team sports is you can have um, an individual person dealing with say a personal problem at home and you cannot understand 
why is the team not performing as a whole? It's like this person's head is here, this person's head is here. But when you can talk to the players individually, you can also understand what's going on on a deeper level. And I believe that actually creates like a bond and a trust between the mm -hmm. coach and the athlete um, to sit down, to get to know the athlete. I mean, there's many times where like international coaches um, will come to say different countries and start to coach, but they don't really know the athletes and the athletes doesn't really know the coach. And then the whole dynamic doesn't work. Um, mm -hmm. So I do find, you know, it's like teams that have, have had coaches that actually, you know, they invest their time, they invest their energy to actually get to know the athletes, to find out what makes the athlete tick. Um, then also like together, you know, like have a mantra together or have like, you know, a team thing that they do to actually like get them all psyched up before the game. Um, it's the type mm -hmm. of thing that you can get them motivated. And to me, that is a thing that's definitely worked over the years. I mean, I've had some athletes um, that like when I talk about the team sports now, I would practice visualization with them because they've had some sort of a mental block, for instance. And then I've had some individual athletes where, you know, they just don't feel confident. They don't have the energy for training. You know, maybe they've got some other issue that's going on outside of training. So you would teach them, you know, when they come into training to, for that hour of their session to put it aside and there's different kind of techniques that you can do um, where like I've got one specific technique, we call it up the zip it up technique. So whatever problem they have, you know, write it on a piece of paper, um, put it in the bag or put it in a pencil bag or something and just put it away for that hour of training and mm -hmm. focus on the task at hand and give their best for their training session because the problem will, it will still be there to deal with. And it, it's difficult, but to bring the problem sometimes into training um, mm -hmm. can definitely cause, you know, a problem with uh, team cohesion. It can cause problem mm -hmm. between the coach and the athletes. So to like work with them individually, finding out, you know, what's going on and stuff like that, it, it makes a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. I feel I know I've like bounced all over the show. Um, no. But, but these are like the types of things that I've done in a team setting mm -hmm. and I found that it worked. Um, and it's not just you as a coach or you as a sports psychologist sitting down instructing athletes, but um, getting their feedback and getting to know each individual mm -hmm. athlete. Because at the end of the day, it, it's a team sport, but there's a bunch of individual people in there. Yes. I think, you know, so amazingly answered. And I think the question is so awesome because at the end of the day, it allows you to take on the role of, of leader because, mm -hmm. you know, it's the same as how you would handle a group in corporates or in a kitchen or you can see I've been watching a lot of MasterChef <laughs> thinking <laughs> no, kitchen. So but awesome. it's true, you know, like you, if, if you can develop that skill, you know, it can help you in so many different facets of life. And what I find so amazing about it as well is that it shows you that it's skills that you can learn. Therefore, everyone can be a leader, right? Which is yeah. something, I'll be honest, I never believed in at first. I thought, you know, oh, some people are just natural born leaders or, you know, whatever. But, you know, the more, you know, I kind of grew into myself and, and learned and asked questions, I found out that that's not a growth mindset. You know, it's skills that, that you learn that, that, can make you into who you are and everyone has the the ability to be a leader and I think exactly what you were saying like understanding that they are individuals in the team and adhering to their needs taking the time to get to know them bond with them form relationships with them then understanding that those individuals need to work together um, holistically because a team won't work if if you know one person is falling behind or one person's not happy like you know you What's that saying? A team, um, a team is as strong as its weakest link. Yes, that's what I was trying to think of. I was like, chain, chain. No, <laughs> not chain. <laughs> yeah. Um, so exactly that. And and I think what could also be such a great, you know, technique as well is to kind of get them all working towards something that's bigger than themselves and bigger than the team. You know, get them towards a common goal because then then they will feel almost you know, that this person's relying on me and it's that sense of like responsibility and camaraderie. And, you know, I think another great thing that could, you know, be really beneficial is also giving different team members specific jobs, you know, specific roles that, you know, they can feel like, cool, 
I, you know, this, the coach asked me to do this because they know I'm good at this. So I've got a, a specific role that I can work towards, you know, um, like, for example, in school, when we played netball, like my role in the team was to keep everyone positive because that was obviously a strength of mine. And, you know, this other person's role was to do X, Y, and Z. And it kind of feels like you've got something smaller that you're working on that can really make a difference in the team. Um, so it gives them that sense of responsibility. And I think people want that. They want to feel that someone trusts them to do something, you know, yeah. um, we all secretly want that responsibility. Um, so I definitely think doing that could help in a team setting. Yeah, no, I agree. Definitely, <laughs> that's, that's right. you answered it very well. <laughs> you answered it better. Um, Mona, it was your <laughs> question. <laughs> no, I so I don't know, maybe if we have time for one more question that I can yes. ask you. Yes. Okay. Um, so this is something I think also, like, I personally love this question. Um, and I think, you know, you would too. Um, and if there's so many people out there that don't know how to deal with this certain thing. Um, and it's like, how do you drown out the crowd and focus on your events during a big competition? I, mm -hmm. I love this question. So, yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Um, again, such an interesting question. I think, you know, I think, again, for things like weightlifting and CrossFit, it can be two completely different things. Um, unless we're obviously going for one rep max in a CrossFit event. But I think, you know, for some people that actually like to draw energy from the crowd, um, whereas for, for other people, they kind of, you know, want to, to keep it out. And again, like in terms of, I'm purely speaking from a CrossFit perspective because it, it could be completely different for weightlifting. But I think also know yourself you know, find those little things that, that drive you and that can make your performance better. So if if paying attention to your competitors, if paying attention to the crowd and, and drawing their energy helps you perform better, find a way to do that in a way that enhances your performance and doesn't jeopardize it because you still want to focus on yourself. Yeah. Um, you know, I often find that when I compete, I, I see it's not even something I think about. I just I zone out. I don't even notice the crowd. But I've noticed that the more I try to zone them out, the more I hear them. Okay. So there's actually it's a it's a theory by Victor E. Frankel called the paradoxical. Um, something i can't remember but basically what he's saying is the more you try to do something the opposite will happen for instance yes. if you can't sleep the the more you try to say to yourself i need to sleep i need to sleep i need to sleep the the more you're going to stay awake so if you go into a competition and you know that you know you you don't like to hear the crowd or you want to zone it out and you keep saying to yourself i'm going to zone them out i'm going to zone them out you're going to bring them in yeah you know it's, it's like you know, this is a, a sorry to um, interrupt you. No, um, there is no like um, where, with coaching, and this is something I learned in university, and I've seen this many times with weightlifters, and I've seen this many times with other athletes as well. It's like as soon as the coach tells you um, don't do that specific thing, you do it. Do like it. if you say don't bend your back, then the athlete bends their back. It's like literally, mm -hmm. I don't know, that uh, same example of like you know, hundred percent. Like, like I know. I know, for instance, in golf, um, you know, they, they actually, um, they, they tell their athletes not when they go to, to hit a putt, right? The minute you say to yourself, don't miss this putt, you're going to miss yeah. it because you are highlighting the negative in that sentence, yeah, right? That's the thing that sticks in the mind. That's the thing that sticks in the mind. However, if you say to yourself, I'm going to get this putt, there's no negative for your, your mind to latch onto. Um, so I, I guess it would be the same in, in competing. If, if you focus too much on it and if you, you keep telling yourself, I don't want to hear them or they make me nervous, you're going to focus on these things and you're not going to focus on your performance. So my advice would be find what works for you and just practice it. Like that's the whole, you know, part of the journey and getting experiences, trial and error. And, you know, if, if, if you don't want to hear the crowd and if you want to zone them out, don't think about it then. Focus on yourself. Yeah. Focus on what you are doing at that exact moment. And you'll see that it'll zone out naturally. We have 25 yeah. seconds remaining. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> You've been kicked off. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So I, if I could quickly bounce off uh, what you just said now, um, what something that I have been taught also my, my whole life is something like the crowd is an uncontrollable. So if you, um, you cannot control how the crowd is going to react. You don't control if you're going to be 